today is Sarah Withy. Sarah, how are you today? I'm doing pretty good. How are you doing? I'm doing really well. I'm uh, enjoying the nasty weather here in Chicago. Oh, that's great because it just started storming not too long ago here in Pittsburgh as well. So, What do you do in Pittsburgh, Sarah? What do I do? I'm a software engineer. Um, I moved here about three years ago. Uh, the company I ended up moving here for uh, they kind of laid off my whole team about 10 months in, so unfortunately, uh, it felt kind of very weird to move here and be like, surprise, your company, you know, that moved you here isn't around anymore. Well, they're around, but our team isn't around anymore. But uh, I've gotten a remote job since then, so I'm still happily here in Pittsburgh and doing pretty good. Uh, well, um, I'm glad you landed on your feet, and I, you probably don't know this about me, but I actually lived in Pittsburgh for about three months in the 1980s. I lived I on Mount Mount Washington. Oh, right Mount about, Washington's uh, Right on nice. Grandview Avenue. I just rented a room, a big house there. Beautiful nice. view. One of the best views, yeah. Yeah. Um, and I just uh, recently saw a video you made at, uh, at PyCon. I think it was in Cleveland. And you were yeah. talking about your pancreas. My <laughs> pancreas, yes. Which I want to talk to you about because I understand that you're a type 1 diabetic. Yes. Uh, so this is my artificial pancreas I'm holding up to the camera. Okay. Uh, as everybody does, it comes in a pouch with a little uh, carabiner key ring attached to it, obviously. Uh, yeah, and so I'm a type 1 diabetic, which basically means type 1s don't make the insulin that their body needs. So for some reason, my pancreas is kind of my real pancreas is just hanging around in my body, not really doing what it should be doing. Uh, type twos, you probably have heard, that's where uh, your body might be making some or all of the insulin, but your body's not using it for some reason. So you've developed this resistance to being able to use the insulin that you do have. But the end result is both of these basically don't produce the biological processes that your body needs to get all the energy. So glucose molecules that come from carbohydrates, they float in your blood. Insulin combines with them, they become basically like a fuel source, and then your cells can take that in to uh, use it for whatever your cells do on a sciencey level. <laughs> okay. Basically. So I, I have, we all have this organ inside of us uh, that produces mm -hmm. insulin, uh, the pancreas, um, yes. and mine is working just fine, and yours is not working just fine, and you're exactly. not. I mean, it's a pretty, it's a relatively common. I mean, it's not an uncommon issue, and so. Yeah. Uh, uh, science has addressed this a long time ago. They've got hardware and they've got software that yeah. has been out there a while to address it, but it's it's imperfect. And the community is working to improve it, right? Yeah. So the tools we have available is obviously um, artificial insulin. So there's uh, the most common one is uh, it's called an insulin analog. And it's basically where uh, bacteria have been designed to make insulin. And so they just produce this all day long and kind of bottle it up and ship it out to people like me who can then use it. Um, one of the other technology tools we have is called a continuous glucose monitor or a CGM. And this is basically a little small piece of plastic that just sticks to my arm or stomach or wherever. And it has a tiny little metal hair basically and it sits just under my skin. Um, it, it's not nearly as painful as it sounds when I describe it, but uh, and it, every five minutes, does a little reading of my blood sugar, so my blood glucose level. And it sends that out uh, over Bluetooth. So my phone can connect to this device, it can get this glucose reading, and every five minutes I can kind of see this graph of what's happening with my blood sugar. So it's really cool that I can see visually at any given time what's happening to my body that doesn't actually do anything on its own correctly. <laughs> And then the other tool is an insulin pump. You know, the older ones used to look like pagers and they're kind of giant and blocky and uh, kind of a nuisance to carry around. Um, newer ones are a little bit smaller. They can actually uh, stick to your arm like the whole device. You don't have to have a giant tube anymore. Although some of them still do have tubes. But it's um, it, a small little computery thing and you just program how much insulin to give you either all day long because your liver still makes glucose. You still have to 
counteract that. Or you can program it based on how much you eat. So if I know I eat so many carbs, I know my rate is so many carbs per insulin amount. And then I tell it, give me this much insulin for that. So um, it can uh, do all this, but it's very manual. So I have to go in and I have to program it the all day amount, or I have to program it to um, give me that dose. But then it'll just kind of squirt it through the tube or squirt it straight into my skin. And then my body just kind of absorbs it. So. Okay, so the, uh, the, the healthcare industry has come up with these two separate devices, and they yes. work independently, right? You, it's up to you, yes. Sarah, to look at the one device and say, oh, my insulin is off, it's low or high, mm -hmm. and then grab the other device and say, I better press this button and yeah. give myself some more or exactly. something like that. And that, that device you showed held up to the camera a few minutes ago, that yep. with the keychain, that's the, that's the bridge between the two. That communicates, right? Yes. Tell me about that. S so it, I guess the official term would be like a feedback loop, as you might hear in like robotics or hardware things, where um, based on a sensor, you perform some action and then, you know, you can turn around and get another reading from a sensor and perform some other actions. That's, that's kind of the process that's happening. So they often call it a looping system. So what it does is it um, gets the values from the last like 15 minutes or so of what's going on with my body. So it gets um, three or four readings from my glucose sensor tries to see what's happening. Am I trending higher? Am I trending lower? Um, and then factor in, like, have I ate anything? Have I given myself extra insulin or less insulin in the last 15 minutes or so? So it kind of bundles this up together and then starts to do some statistics to say, is this deviating from normal and how far off is this amount? So there's actually uh, rates that we know of how much, you know, uh, if your blood sugar is rising at this rate, this much insulin will bring it down. Um, but also, you know, how much food we have, you need this much insulin to counteract it. So uh, these are kind of rates we should generally know if we're doing pretty good. But uh, so factoring all those in, it kind of mathematically says, okay, well, it looks like in the near future, I will need more insulin or less insulin to counteract whatever's going on at the moment. So this device can then turn around and connect to an insulin pump, which usually works over like the 400 to 900 megahertz frequencies. There's kind of two different uh, sets that they can work on mm -hmm. and says, okay, you know, for the next so many minutes, give you more or less insulin based on that. So it sets like a whole bunch of temporary values constantly to, to offset everything. So it's kind of a cool system that, uh, and the best thing is I used to have to do all this myself. So I used to, at every meal, you know, I'm constantly thinking like, how many carbs do I think are on my plate? Well, doing the math, you know, I divide by my insulin rate. I know this much insulin I need. So then I take it, I have to kind of check with myself periodically to see like, you know, did I do this right? Did I do this wrong? Did I um, give myself not enough? And so I have to give myself more insulin later. Or the fun thing I like to say is uh, diabetics oh, are the yeah. only person I know that regularly overdose on their medicine uh, and then have to figure it out themselves. So if I take too much insulin, I basically overdosed, bad things happen. I have to, you know, take some more sugar to kind of counteract that. So it's a very weird system. It's very annoying to have to do this all the time myself. It, it's just mentally taxing. So the great thing about a system like this is it takes so much of the workload off of me and it's not perfect. Like I still have to intervene periodically, but it takes us down from just this huge workload to just kind of the periodic once in a while, like pull up my phone. Yeah, things are fine, you know. Yeah. Uh, and uh, the code, the logic that's on that device, that's uh, that's code that's open sourced, right? People, the yeah. community has contributed to that. Tell me a little about that. Yeah, there's a couple of devices now that are closed source that med tech companies have done, but they've only started making those because the open source community has been making pancreas systems for so long and have gotten so good at it that the med oh. companies actually don't like this. But uh, the system... I, I wonder why they didn't start sooner. Uh, it seems like there's a market for it. Yeah, there's lots of, you know, med tech companies I think are in it for the money. So well, they would have to spend a lot of money to try and develop all these things and get it FDA approved. And they're just kind of like, well, people are buying what we have now. We don't have to worry about it. But 
there's, okay. there's I think some more politics going on back there. No, I totally get it. And I, I, I don't fault them for being in <laughs> in business to make money. Yeah. That's, that's how they feed their children. But <laughs> but also we have we actually have people's health and lives at stake here. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, so the system I use is called OpenAPS, and it's the Open Artificial Pancreas System. Uh, GitHub.com slash OpenAPS is where you can get the code for that. And that runs on either an Intel Edison, which they don't make anymore, but I happen to have one of those, or a Raspberry Pi Zero in an Explorer board that goes on to that. So that's a little board that talks over the 900 megahertz or the 400 megahertz that you need for the insulin pump. Uh, and so for that one, the logic exists on this device. So this actually runs a version of Debian Linux. And so it uh, talks over Wi-Fi to get the blood sugar values and then um, sends the, you know, the radio frequencies to the pump to do things. Hmm. The other major one is called LoopKit, and it's usually based for iOS. So you have to have an iOS phone. Um, and then it uses a hardware thing called O'Reilly Link. And that's basically the Bluetooth to 900 megahertz bridge. So it doesn't do the calculations on that. It does the calculations on the phone. Um, and the other downside is you have to compile the app yourself and put it on the phones. They, they don't have it in the store or anything. But hmm. if once you do that, um, a lot of people like that because it's um, also pretty reliable and everything just kind of works on the phone. And um, you don't ever have to log into the rightly link. You just kind of turn it on and it works. Or is this every so often I have to kind of jump in and make sure security updates and things like that can happen. So, uh, yeah, those are the two main systems. Oh, and LoopKit is github.com slash LoopKit. So all okay. of that information is on there. And then the other third piece is there's a cloud instance called Night Scout. And that's what's sort of collecting all the blood sugar values and the doses and everything. So it's sort of the data warehouse, if you will. And it's at github.com slash nightscoutfoundation slash cgm dash remote dash monitor. Oh, you better send me that. <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll type that up for you. But Thanks. Um, that one's a little bit wordier. But yeah, so it's also open source and you can deploy it to a free instance of Heroku. So there's hmm. literally, aside from, you know, the device of whatever pancreas system you use, there's no real cost to this. Which is kind of nice. Um, and the, the, these are all open source, and so yes. the contributions are coming from the community. They come from uh, yeah. geeks like us. Geeks like us. Are, yeah. Sure is, is it is that safe? Is it um, um, that would be a concern of mine? Is that I've got these strangers that are not doctors and not scientists. They're just good programmers. Uh, <laughs> how do I know that they're uh, calculating the right amount of insulin to inject into my body? Yeah, and that was definitely one of my first concerns, you know, because it's like I love technology, but saying like I'm going to trust this thing to give me a bunch of medicine and, you know, good luck, you know, it's kind of yeah. one of those things I was definitely concerned about. Yeah, and uh, there's been lots of research. Uh, Dana Lewis was one of the ones that came up with the initial research, and she took uh, collections of blood sugar values from people and developed these algorithms and then tested them kind of on these people's blood sugars to kind of see if that would match uh, what was expected. So she wrote this big research paper on that. Her husband is also a software engineer, so he'd kind of written a few scripts to kind of help do these automatic dosing things. And combined with some other people that had figured out how to reverse engineer some of these pumps, some other people had figured out how to reverse engineer uh, the glucose sensors sort of combining all these pieces together has come up with these artificial pancreas systems. And even though there's LoopKit and there's OpenAPS and Android APS, all, all of these systems really are based on a lot of the same technologies. So if you actually dug in really deep, you would see a lot of them are borrowing different pieces from each other. Hmm. So it's, um, th they're different ecosystems, but they're very much all like brothers and sisters kind of, uh, in, the open source world. So it's really kind of cool to see um, all this come together. And they're also not like repos that were developed five years ago and nobody's really touched and they're kind of barely hanging on. They, they're very actively maintained all the time. Um, okay. I once turned on notifications on some of the repos just so I could see what's going on. And I got overwhelmed. I had to turn it off. It was uh, so many commits and pushes and releases and everything. So. Okay, well, that's good. That means if, yeah. if some mistake happens, then it's corrected very quickly because there are yeah. so many eyes on it. 
And there's probably at least 2,000 people running systems like this. I, I imagine the number is oh. possibly a little higher. So there's quite a bit of testing out in the wild Yeah, that's uh, going on. Uh, is the government involved in this at all? Do they um, oversee things like open source healthcare projects? That's an interesting question. There's a few things that are kind of up in the air right now. So one hmm. is the FDA sort of has kind of turned away from looking at this open source movement right now. And the reason hmm. is because it's sort of like a single person experiment, which they don't regulate. So the fact I'm doing this on myself, um, the FDA is just kind of like, well, do your thing. You know, we're, we're not really paying attention. If I went to try and sell this as its own device, that would be a separate thing. Okay. So there's a lot of intricate wording around, you know, you're, you're taking your own risk by doing this, even though there's, you know, tons and tons and tons of people that have said these systems are amazing and you should absolutely get one if you need it. But uh, so there's that. The other thing is um, the FDA does have to come in if you put these apps on a Play Store or the Apple Store. Mm. So the FDA would have to, um, you know, look over the app and make sure it's working along with the devices and do all the testing and stuff, which has one, mm. been one of the hurdles I think the med tech company has not wanted to do for a while. But they're mm. starting to do it. There's, there's, um, you know, the apps for the CGMs are out there on the store. They've been out there for a little while. Um, there's slowly this movement into getting, you know, artificial pancreas systems out there in apps. There is also a group called Tide Pools. They're a, a nonprofit, um, or Tide Pool Loop, sorry. They're trying to sort of bridge this open source, closed source gap. So they're trying to take this open source software that has been proven to work for so long and people love it and say like, well, we want to work with these med tech companies that are very much like nobody can see what we're doing. We're being very private with this. You know, you can't see our code. You can't know how our devices work and say, we want to allow your closed source devices to work with our open source software. And both of these have been proven to work pretty well, but together they can work better. Hmm. And so they, I, th I think it was in May of last year, they had filed um, with the FDA to try and get an app approved that would sort of bridge this gap. And last I heard, they're still kind of pending FDA things. So I'm still kind of waiting to see what happens there. Is the hardware also open source? The glucose sensors are not, and the insulin pumps are not. What about that other device, the IoT device that you showed us? Yeah. Uh, so the Intel Edison is a thing made by Intel. It's not open source, but all the okay. software that runs it is. Got it. So all okay. the Linux stuff that runs on here is. Um, the Explorer board, which is that transmitter board, it is open source. And then the Riley link, which is the one that communicates over the iOS devices, it is open source. So you can actually go and download the schematics for the hardware. You can find the bugs if you find any and actually upload new versions. So I, I know there's been some people that have found the flaws in the early editions and actually fixed hmm. them. Um, people are volunteering their time to write this code, it sounds like. Uh, but there is some cost to things like, uh, you mentioned Heroku hosting and some of the data that gets stored. Uh, yeah. where, who's paying for that? So Heroku has a free instance. And it's, oh. uh, what is it? It's, I think the limit is like 750 hours a month. But it's kind of like, my instance that runs in the background just runs just enough to like barely skirt under that amount. So yeah. it's, it's remained free for me, even though I have to have a credit card filed on, on, on file with them. It's, it's never cost me anything. Yeah. Uh, there used to be a database called or database system called MLab, but they've discontinued that and MongoDB sort of absorbed them. So you can still create a free um, Atlas cluster. So that's what's, the database backing behind Night Scout. So Night Scout's sort of like the API on top of the database. Uh, and that's also free for what, 500 megabytes, I think. Hmm. But, you know, after a while, that's, I don't know, I've, I've been running a pancreas device for three years and I haven't, uh, I've still been under that 500 megabyte limit. I, I had to periodically clean out some like cache stuff, hmm. but 
like I still have my values from three years ago that I can actually pull up and still look at if I wanted to. So it, it's managed to be a still pretty reliable thing for being free on Heroku and MongoDB's servers. Uh, Sarah, are you looking at the code or contributing to the code at all? I have looked at the code before. Um, I've wanted to kind of file some bugs, but I realized I didn't know Node so well at the time that my current job actually does Node. So I've, I've learned a lot since then. One of the things I did want to do is there's a lot of manual steps you have to do to install these things. You have to kind of go through massive amounts of documentation and just kind of do this, do this, do this. Um, and that's fine for somebody like me who's used computers forever. I, I'm perfectly comfortable with command line things and Linux. Uh, you know, that's not so much for non-technical people or maybe people that are newer to technology that haven't had that, you know, super in-depth sure. command line people. experience. Yeah. And I've started working on like some installer apps that maybe if you mm -hmm. just plugged in one of your devices and it could flash it, um, and sort of upload configuration kind of automatically so you don't have to mess with that. Um, I really need to pull that back out and kind of finish up on some of it. But that was kind of one of the things I wanted to do was sort of work on a way to make this really technical thing a little bit more accessible to people that weren't technology people. That sounds great. Yeah. Is there anything we haven't covered on this topic that we should have? Um, Kind of running through all the things in my mind. That sounds like a no. And I know some people have asked if this can be hacked. And, ah. you know, I, I think to say some device on the internet can't be hacked is, you know, kind of iffy. Any security person would probably shake their finger at that. But, uh, <laughs> you know, I, I think there's a certain level of nonsense you would have to go through to even try and hack this. So, like if I'm out and about, my phone is broadcasting a Wi-Fi point. This is connecting to the Wi-Fi point. Um, you know, I, I think you would have to figure out what my Wi-Fi point is and break into that and then figure out what this IP address is and then try and break into Linux and then say like, haha, I'm going to dose Sarah her whole insulin pump and cause chaos. But my insulin pump beeps anytime it gets a little message. And then it's really slow, like, like the tubing is just really thin. And so it takes a really long time to dose. So if you hated me and that was the way you wanted to um, slowly take me to my death, I guess you could. But I feel like the hurdle behind it is so much. But even then, like the alarms would go off and I'm starting to go low and I could go fix it real quick. So, uh, you know, it's like not not really even reasonable to hack. I guess the other hacking point would be you could go into Night Scout and change some of the values, but that would only be temporary because you'll just keep getting new values and overwrite those. Hmm. So, you know, overall, I think there's a certain level of hacking that doesn't really make sense for a system like this. You're, you're not, yeah. you're causing more annoyance than like actual trouble almost. Uh, there's a principle of security which says that uh, your goal should be to make the cost of a security breach higher than the value of anything you would gain from that breach. So I'd have to really put a high value on Sarah's demise to jump <laughs> through all those hoops. It would have to be really something I really, really, really wanted to do. And, or maybe I could get some real serious cash out of it. You, have to be as like of today, that's not true. So I think you're saying. Oh, thank, thanks. I appreciate that. <laughs> You have to be like my truly like arch nemesis kind of thing yeah. to be like, I'm destroying Sarah at all costs. Mm, yes. <laughs> uh, are you, are you, I saw your talk, I, I'm pretty sure it was in Cleveland. Was it at PyCon? Are you still talking so. about this? You have something coming up? Um, I don't have anything coming up, you know, kind of due to the pandemic and sort of a little bit of uncertainty, kind of everything's up in the air at the moment. Uh, I would be, I'll continue to propose this at conferences and continue to okay. kind of speak out um, as much as I can. It's it's a fun talk I love to give because yeah. not only is it like cool to talk about like I'm a cyborg and I've used technology <laughs> to kind of fix problems with my body, but also I, I love watching people's eyes just kind of like light up like, whoa, I had no clue that's a thing, you know? Yeah, that was me. Um, 
but also kind of breaks stereotypes where I think people think diabetics are, you know, oh, grandpa likes too much pie <laughs> and not like people like me. Like I didn't cause my pancreas to break down. I, we don't know why it happened. Mm -hmm. we, we, we don't know a disease. We haven't found the factors in my blood. We, we don't know what's caused it. So, you know, something happened and it doesn't seem to be repairing itself. So it's not, I'm what, eight and a half years into my diabetic diagnosis and uh, I'm still about as terrible off as I was eight and a half years ago. So. Mm -hmm. But you're able to manage it better thanks to this yeah. uh, hardware and software. And that's why I like talking about it too, is to kind of maybe break those mental ideas of diabetics being people that love their sugar and not, yeah. you know, just regular people that just have a endocrine problem basically. Uh, for the record, I am an ice cream addict. So, um, I'm I not, just got I'm done with a bike ride that. on Saturday, where a whole bunch of women biked around Pittsburgh, and then we stopped in an ice cream shop, and I kind of loved it. Yeah, but you wouldn't know what to look at me, but I'm a man that enjoys a good dessert. <laughs> I, I can appreciate that. If we ever are able to see each other in person again, we should go. Uh, uh, absolutely, I, and I hope we do. I hope our paths cross at an in-person conference in the near future. Yes. And uh, until then, this was great. It's, uh, I really appreciate your time. Thank you, Sarah. Yeah, thank you for having me. One of the things I love about technology is not just that it's cool, but that it's enabled me to meet many friends in real life through um, LiveJournal in the early 2000s, through an instant messenger, through you know, Slack, Twitter, all sorts of online communities I'm in now. I've loved that I've been able to make friends and interact with people through technology. It's been really wonderful. And I look forward to uh, when the world opens up post pandemic and uh, I can still meet people with technology, but I don't have to rely on it as much that's my only way of interacting with friends.